who made this statement out of frustration in the 1960s. He couldn't find any hymns for his congregation to sing that seemed to. He liked the classics, but he wasn't something that spoke to the needs. And the 1960s were just at the cusp of, of a kind of a hymnic revolution at that time. Uh, everything from folk hymnody to uh, what we call the hymnic explosion of, of both British and American hymn writers. And he said, that he, he said, tell me what you sing and I'll tell you who you are. Um, and I think that there's a lot to say about that. And part of this is, is to look at the idea, uh, not in really a judgmental sense, again, I've kind of given up on a lot of that, except for certain things that I feel very strongly about, but, <laughs> but, but on the, the idea of um, how, what kind of things we sing shape the piety of our congregation. We really believe that, as so many people have said, you know, I don't care who writes the theology, I, it's coming who writes the hymns. It's quotes like that with the balance, you know. Um, then, then who are we? I think the question, though, for us in our congregations is not just who we are, but who we wish, who we want to become. Uh, new hymnals are being uh, explored these days. And I think a wise hymnal committee doesn't just put a finger in the air and see which way the wind's blowing. But also says, what is the what is the nature of the church that we are a part of, and what do we wish that church could become, and how can we, at least in part, sing our way into that? Uh, it's a faith formation tool, and uh, but it, it it's uh, it's always been kind of vague. You know, it was assumed everything from Luther and Calvin uh, and Wesley's and others that that the singing and faith formation was very important. What kind of how do we go about that more specifically? What are some of the sources? And especially as we look at the 21st century. Another friend of mine, who's actually a, United, a retired United Methodist bishop, um, Juan Martinez, um, was, was uh, at our school about over 10 years ago introducing the new Spanish language United Methodist hymnal, Don Bosa's Padre Sarabrar. And he uh, was talking about these kind of issues and the importance of the church's song, especially the song coming out today. And he, he said something that really affected me. Uh, he said, each generation of the church needs to add its stanza to the great hymn of the church. Each generation of the church needs to add, needs to add its stanza to the great hymn of the church. And uh, that's a metaphorical statement, but it's so uh, integral to the, uh, the overall uh, issue that it, I think it's quite powerful. Uh, for example, when you uh, when you start a uh, when you sing a hymn, you don't start on stanza four. Uh, a hymn has a progression of ideas, and so uh, we, we don't leave out our heritage. There's a lot of arrogance that leaves out the songs of the saints. Now, you know, obviously those get paired, and sometimes new ones come to light, or there's fresh translations, uh, but. But uh, we have a tremendous heritage in, in song, and uh, uh, I think there's a, a, ours is a faith that remembers. It remembers so it knows where it's going. Uh, it's not, a, it's not a, a faith of amnesia. And so those early stanzas are really important. Likewise, you don't start in stanzas one and two and stop. Unless it's an invitation to him and it's actually lunch and you got to go. <laughs> but uh, uh, you, don't, you don't stop. Uh, hymns carry us to a certain place. Uh, I'm not going to go into a, a presentation on how hymns end. There's, a, there's a, a lot of reasons, but the final stanzas of hymns are very important in how they get us to a certain place. Uh, but they, they take us someplace. And so there's an equal arrogance that decides that, say, uh, the Holy Spirit stopped around 1900. Uh, that the Holy Spirit's not still at work among us. And so with those kind of things in mind, I want to focus at this point on what I think our stanza looks like. Um, at least to some degree. I don't think this is uh, uh, the def definitive study because there's, there's several caveats in how you collect this information and what's possible. But I think it's a start. And uh, I would say that what I'm about to tell you I use with you, in 15 years after the next round of hymnals come out, I'd have to revise. Because I think the stanza is always changing. 
Um, but I would say this, the stanza of what's available to us now in the church um, is the most diverse of any in the history of the church. Uh, some of you were old enough to think about hy earlier hymnals, which were uh, much simplified in terms of the variety of songs that were available and the sources from which those songs come. Um, uh, so it's, it's an extremely diverse stanza. I think that that has practical implications. Uh, the range of musical styles in any given hymnal, uh, many hymnals at least, are, are just, is extremely diverse. And for one person to really know all those styles is really, is really quite uh, uh, a chore. You know, I, when I went to college, I thought, well, I know Renaissance, Baroque, Classic, Romantic, and then certain certain kinds of 20th century styles, maybe a little folk. I was set for life. Well, that doesn't begin to touch what's available to us now and how we can somewhat, with integrity, introduce those into the life of the congregation. That said, let's just dive into this a little bit and uh, uh, see where it takes us. Uh, I decided to use my own metaphor of streams uh, to go at this. I wanted streams because uh, streams have a source someplace. There's a point, I guess, where you can, you can walk, you can jump across the Mississippi River. <laughs> it, it has some kind of source. Uh, and as it travels, it picks up other streams that flow into it. Um, streams also meander. They're not canals. Now, I couldn't visually represent this on this page, uh, but I'm not much of an artist. But streams have a way of, of going into other streams and out and things of that nature. So song is very fluid. Uh, the song is one of the easiest things to transport around the world. Someone hears a song in one place and brings it back and sings it. Uh, they may not sing exactly the way they heard it, but it's recognizable and then it carries on its own traditions. Uh, so uh, like, like these streams, um, what I want to propose is these various streams here have a source and a certain kind of piety. And I'm using that in, in a technical sense, not in a derogatory sense, a certain way of believing, a certain way of responding to belief, a certain way of articulating faith, uh, a certain way groups are, are certain kind of patterns where they people uh, come together around a kind of, of faith, and the song expresses that. Um, streams also are active. Sometimes they're growing, overflowing flowing the banks. Other times they're receding. So we'll find that some of these are, are growing, some of them are receding. We'll also find that uh, some streams are extremely complex. There are streams within streams. There are certain places where the, the, the water flows more quickly and it's dangerous to get caught in that section. In the, in, even in the same wide Mississippi River, there are certain ways you can trap it and you know the, the sources. So there's, there's all sorts of things about streams, I think, that uh, uh, it helps us with this metaphor. I end up with seven streams. Um, this started with a, a very nerdy project about 20, I don't know, well not 20, 20 years ago, 17, 18 years ago, when I was asked by the Hill Society of the United States and Canada to, to uh, do a little survey of what hymnals had in common, kind of ecumenically. And uh, I'll save that story for another time, but uh, I, uh, I did that survey. I, I just thought it was going to be a practical thing. I never thought of it as anything else. And little by little, I realized that there were patterns emerging as I surveyed 40 some hymnals in North America uh, of things that were in common. Uh, and I was particularly inter interested in emerging things, emerging kinds of hymns and songs. What was that saying? And little by little, these things crystallized. And uh, so I, I came up with seven strings. Now, one of the reasons was seven, that's, uh, on a layout page, that's the, the most I could get. In, uh, but uh, uh, it's not quite that, uh, that way, but it gives us an idea. Then I, I realized, in broad terms, but the idea was not to pigeonhole every hymn. As a matter of fact, some, some songs actually fit in more than one stream in some cases. Some writers write in more than one stream. So that wasn't the purpose, but to give a broad overview of, of what was available, and then what did that say? Uh, what kind of theology was emphasized in certain streams? 
they seem to be contributing different theological uh, focuses. What would those be? And then, what surprised me, and it hadn't occurred to me before until I got a visual layout and started to work with this, was in broad terms, musical style relates to theology. Certain styles seem to be used to communicate certain theology. Uh, and I, I kind of suspected that, but this started to, to uh, impress me a little bit more as a, as a situation. So that in mind, it would seem that if we exist just in one style, we're going to be singing a limited theology. Uh, and part of being a 21st century congregation is, is uh, diversifying. I'm not suggesting one sings every, out of seven streams every service. That's probably a good way to retirement, divorce or otherwise. Uh, but I would think over a period of, of a month or so, one could sing out of four or five of these pretty successfully uh, and still meet liturgical needs. And I think one would produce a healthier singing congregation. I wouldn't be in this business if I didn't think that one hallmark of a, of a healthy congregation was, was singing together and at least going out with gusto uh, and, and finding that that's very important. That's a hallmark of Christian worship experience throughout history. Even Quakers have a hymnal. Uh, so it's just, not all religions are like that. You know, if you were a Taoist, uh, you would probably uh, go as a personal act of devotion and drop by uh, a place to pray and offer some alms on the way to work and leave a little offering. And, and uh, that would be it. That would be your total experience. It wouldn't be a group experience of people singing. So, uh, uh, and in spite of different faith traditions, there seems to be a real, and, and different styles of singing, there's a, a real focus that singing is integral to the Christian faith and the Christian witness. Okay, let's look at these just a little bit and see what happens. I have on the first page a, uh, an overview with some of the examples. I can't go through these in, in, in great depth at all. On the second page, when you flip over, you see some examples. They're from a wide variety of hymnals. Some of you may or may not know all of them. Uh, I might just try to just do a couple of examples with you in, in a few cases so that you can just make sure we're on the same page. After the Second Vatican Council, then, uh, Catholics started to sing congregation with much more intentionality. It wasn't that it was absent before, but uh, the Second Vatican Council put a much higher premium on that. And indeed, there were uh, certain uh, energies that affected not just Catholics, but also uh, all Protestant groups, a lot of ecumenical activity in the late 60s and 70s. Uh, so the uh, singing uh, took on certain structures out of that. It, there became sort of what would be called uh, affectionately the, the, the four hymn sandwich in the Catholic liturgy. So uh, the opening introit, which was a song, was replaced by a processional hymn. Uh, the um, offertory song was replaced by an offertory hymn. Uh, songs have been sung in many cases uh, in different places in the world historically during, during Eucharist. And then a, a closing or sending forth him at the end. Uh, it's really interesting if you go to a Mass, uh, people are there primarily for the Eucharist, not for the sermon. Uh, and once the Eucharist is done, they're out of there. And I, I know I, I've had some students who were working in Catholic churches, and I was there to observe. And I turn around at the final hymn and I realize I'm one of the few people still left. All of them have gone, you know. I'm conditioned to stay there. There might be an altar call. <laughs>
but it's got that wonderful frame. And even in that hymn, you find there's a change in point of view. The stanzas are the point of view of God speaking to us, which really were intended originally to be a cantor. And then people respond, here I am, Lord. You got these kids who to sing both. But it's, it's all right. Mm -hmm. People like to sing the whole thing. But I, I, I'm sure a lot of people sing that and don't realize they're changing points of view. And it was designed for that purpose. So you find a lot of hymnody that's, that's good for Eucharist and for coming forward when you don't want things in your hands. Uh, it's hard to go up and accept Eucharist if you're carrying a hymn book. And so a refrain form opens up possibilities. One of the most famous of these would be one red, one body. And, uh, and God and Methodist hymnal and several others. And 
it said it had never occurred to him from his private perspective that it would be sun set from the song. Mm -hmm. So, but that just shows you how things migrate. It's not a question of whether it's wrong, it's just things migrate in different traditions and views. So, uh, uh, one example of a Spanish one, the Teposenos. Teposenos, Padre Nuestro, on el lío y con el pan. And I forgot the other words, but it's very nice. And then it's a little refrain that comes from Central America. Let us offer to the Father with the bread and with the wine. All our joys and all our sorrows, all our cares for all our wine. And then there's solo refrain, or stanzas that go with it. But you're supposed to kind of, you know, you can just see. Latinos kind of dancing down the aisle on that one, toward the other one. So that's a, a strong one there. Let's move ahead to the next one. A lot of us would live uh, primarily in, in standard in, in the second stream, which is quite varied. Um, writers like uh, Carl Daw, uh, Michael Perry, Sherry Lynn Murray, Brian Wren, Fred Pratt Green, Tom Prober, Timothy W. Smith, Fred Kahn, Albert Bailey, Ruth Duck. Uh, a, whole, a whole group of people that work out of the stream. Uh, some of the things that you'll find about this stream that are really interesting, the uh, emphases, if I'm looking for hymns on justice, this stream is going to be one of the ones I'm going to look at. It's not absent from other ones, but this is a really primary focus here. You will find some hymns on, on the, the sacraments. Uh, you'll find hymns on the, that are scripture-based, scripture uh, lots of writers here try to fill out the lectionary with specific hymns that, that may be on, on scripture that shows up once every three years, but they want a hymn on it. Uh, that kind of attention to scripture, perhaps song paraphrases. Uh, this, is a, this is a stream that's going to probably take inclusive language the most seriously. So if you're looking, that's a priority for you in terms of the relation to humanity and to God. This is the stream that you're going to... Uh, Again, I'm, you know, I'm talking about things since roughly 1960s at this point. Uh, a lot of ones you'll recognize in this one. If you flip over, when in our music, God is glorified, for example, with Paul in the stream. Fred uh, got uh, Timothy W. Smith's paraphrase of my need to God tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. Uh, let's see, uh, oh, some of you know uh, Vitus. God of the sparrow, God of the whale, etc. Just a, a lot of freedom here. Uh, Michael Perry's uh, text, uh, Bless Be the God of Israel, which is a paraphrase of Zechariah's hymn. Um, it's often sung to the tune of the house tune. Bless be the God of Israel, which you take with a, a specific kind of polka beat, I think really improves. <laughs> <laughs> Shirley Rayner Murray, uh, quite a number of pieces here. Let me move ahead down this a little bit more. Uh, one of the things that will be distinctive about doing this project in North America is the African American stream, which is now, uh, most, most hymnals have a canon of spirituals that has sort of evolved since 1950s or so. But even more than that, gospel songs, and, and most hymnals that come out now will have lift every voice and sing. Uh, the so-called black national anthem, American National Anthem. Uh, uh, but it ranges. You, know, you, you have uh, the spirituals that may be precious for it, take my hand on Dorsey, uh, a few like that too. Uh, even now, uh, more recent writers like Richard Smallwood, uh, Andre Crouch, of course, Bless the Lord on My Soul, and some others like that. Uh, uh, a little more. Kurt Franklin would be a little bit more on the edge for some people, even in the black church. Uh, so this is a pretty complex stream. I'm not sure in the next, if I were to do this in about 15 years, I think this would even be broken out. Because there's sort of the edgy Kurt Franklin hip hop stream. And then in the black church, there's some that don't go there. It's a pretty complex uh, stream in and of itself. But it's become a very important part of, of, of our story. Uh -huh. Do you consider Sunday to be a congregational song? It is the United Methodist Hymn, and believe it or not, it works. No, I don't. <laughs> it, it, it is, the United Methodists have come to really love it. I mean, it's not like the sun every Sunday, but uh, the people will sing the refrain and the choir will sing stanza and different things. It, it's surprising what 
Sam Young had this uh, editor that, you know, liked to stick in some things that, that just were kind of outrageous. <laughs> and every once in a while they took. It's amazing uh, how many United Methods we have here. Uh, you haven't said that? It's it's choir. Yeah, it's often used in choir piece too. But, um, you know, I've, I've been in several conferences and in a couple of congregations where, I've, where it's been used. It, it partly, partly depends on how it's introduced. Um, for example, if you really introduce it, just having that opening, that little refrain on the left side, and let the soloist or someone carry the second page, bring in old soprano sax on that, people want to try it. I mean, if they sing the Lord's Prayer, <laughs> my lot's Lord's Prayer, they can sing come Sunday. Part of it's picking it for the right place at the right time and setting it up. I don't think you just say, oh, let's turn to him 7.9. I'll stand and sing come Sunday. That <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, but it, uh, I think this is, in 15 years, I'm not sure there'll be anything else to add to this one. So I would call this you know, a waning stream. Uh, one stream that really surprised me was the folk stream. Uh, sort of the successors of Lord of the Dance. And as a, any of you that were around in the 60s and anti-Vietnam and all that kind of stuff, uh, you know, blowing in the wind, 110 soldier, all those kind of things. I know not many of you were around there. Uh, uh, I mean, this is the stuff they're going to be singing in my funeral. <laughs> and uh, uh, very much a, a, a a, a stream that communicates in its folk style, acoustic folk style, a narrative. Roar of the Dance is a kind of a storytelling. There's several that have a storytelling. Uh, there's often a prophetic little punch. Uh, Marty Howden, who writes in several of these streams, he can write in stream two. He's, he's, a, he's not a Roman Catholic, but he knows where his bread and butter He's Bob in stream one. But he writes well in this particular stream. Let me find one here that, uh, this, I mean, this could have come, this been sung by Peter Paul and Mary Kingston. Singer trio. Uh, here. I mean, he had he was around then. Uh, he went to a lot of Peter Paul Mary concerts. <laughs> By the way, don't use four digits for a, a hymnal. Somehow we can only memorize three. <laughs> original 
language is a feminine tense. Uh, it's not a masculine tense. So uh, uh, he rightly, I think, uses a feminine pronoun. At the ruach, food, the breath of God, food. The breath was was feminine tense in, in Hebrew. So uh, that's what he's picking. A little, little bit of radical ideas with feminine and those kind of things. Uh, uh, so many good ones right there. Uh, I think Kurt Kaiser's pass it on. I mean, and that you know, that's not really you know rock band music. Uh, that, that's that's music around a campfire. Uh, so uh, so you know uh, John Gilsabacher's Morning Cry. Uh, I mean that that's a guitar piece. Don't organ that up too much. And it's got that narrative feel. It goes throughout. Uh, so, uh, the stream six, then I think, but uh, one of the things about this, this thing is you look over the chart, streams three and six are interesting because by the time they get hymnal collections, the groups that focus primarily on streams three and six are often in another have moved on. Uh, and so what we have in stream six here are, are the classics that go back 30, sometimes almost 40 years. Uh, and uh, some of those started off more or less in stream five folky feel, but they moved. There are different piety. For example, see, he starts the kingdom of God comes out of a charismatic context. Uh, let Karen Lafferty use him. But it was really a folk back then, but it's, it's really part of the piety of a, uh, of a Pentecostal tradition, much more. And uh, Nysham's As a Deer, uh, of course, Charlie and Chet in, in uh, Sydney, Australia, Shop of the Lord, John Wimber of the, uh, uh, what was his group? Uh, thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, the Spirit Song is his primary one, Amy Grant, uh, Paris, uh, you know, the Greatest of the Lord, Michael W. Smith, uh, these, are, these are all classics now. And the people that live in Stream 6 may sing these once in a while, but they moved on to, to new stuff. This would be kind of like, oh, your grandfather was singing. Oh. <laughs> uh, but the piety hasn't changed a whole lot. Uh, you're going to find uh, first person expressions uh, of faith. You're not going to find like a Trinitarian theology very often, for example. Uh, strong praise, and, uh, an adoration, uh, scripture fragments. Uh, experiential kinds of, uh, you, you find uh, in some others too, but this one has a, a, a hymns that express a lot of intimate language in terms of relationship with Christ. That's, uh, that's not uh, the first time that's happened. A lot, of, a lot of 19th century gospel songs express that kind of language. Bernard Clairvaux expressed that kind of language. So it, it just comes back in a different style. Um, so, uh, you can see, I mean, kind of the precursions of that with the spirit of the living God fall fresh on me, uh, coming out of this this kind of uh, this particular thing. Uh, and then finally, the rest of the world. Um, it's not fair to put the rest of the world in one stream, but in terms of proportions of how it appears in hymnals uh, at this point, I, I would see in 15 years that I would need to have just a Spanish language stream. Because there's some things theologically although they come from some of the other sources that I express. Uh, hymns about being on a journey. It's a very Spanish language idea. Uh, certain kinds of familial relationships come up in Spanish language hymns. Um, those kind of things that are a little bit uh, different. It uh, depends on our immigrant populations and things like that. I also put the Zay and Iona over in this last global stream because it didn't fit comfortably in the others. And I treated it kind of as a, a global music since it's really those those communities music is spread around the world quite a bit. But once again, I could put John Bell in stream two sometimes. I could put John Bell in stream uh, five sometimes. And he's even tried to imitate gospel, African American gospel songs. Um, and sometimes they write kind of things that you could almost call stream one. So the purpose is not to pigeonhole every hymn, but to get an overview. Some observations, and I'm going to take us through one exercise. Um, each of these streams not only has a different theological emphasis, but because of the musical styles that are broadly associated. Uh, I think they all have their own soundscape. So singing more broadly has practical implications for how we actually, the resources we use in church. Now, unless you've got Robert Hobby at your church, 
or someone like that, uh, you know, who can really do, but, but I was talking, we were working together and I, and he says, you know, there's times not to play the organ. And uh, there's times to, uh, to get off the bench. Uh, John Ferguson says this, uh, you know, a lot of the really good organists know when not to play and when to use the piano or when to actually ask for another idiom altogether, when to add some percussion. Uh, I think uh, one, in terms of a music ministry, and I think functioning in, in this role, when I graduated from school, I kind of thought, the underlying philosophy was that, that everything musical and leadership was going to emanate from me. Uh, and, you know, I would uh, look at my resources, press certain buttons, things would happen, I'd be the same of that. I, I don't think that's unfair to say. I don't, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I think we were trained to be the sort of choir masters. I think now, as you look across this and trying to function in the 21st century, you need to be more of a team leader, working with some people whose gifts complement yours, but there may be things you can't do. I don't think many of us can function uh, equally well across all these streams. It's just too broad musically. But you may have people who have certain gifts that do. Uh, so I think it has implications for how we actually conduct music. But another issue is, uh, well, the soundscape is going to be different. You know, I look at stream two, that's an organ-based one primarily. Stream one could be piano, could be guitar, could be uh, organ. And stream three is off of organ and piano together. Uh, and maybe in the more recent, you know, trap set and various keyboards, heavy percussion. And then as you move, the further you move over, uh, percussion becomes increasingly important mm -hmm. um, as, as the bass as opposed to a strict keyboard bass. And even keyboard becomes used like percussion at times. Um, another thing that's really interesting to note, I think, is that stream two is about the only stream that continuously the com composition of the text and the composition of the music are separated. Um, in most of these other streams, the same person writes the text and music. Um, uh, it just says it's a different way of forming something. But what a lot of us thought of as normative is now the anomaly. Now, in, within your church or in your tradition, stream two may still be the dominant stream. But in terms of the spectrum of what's available now in the 21st century, there's a shift uh, along that line. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that that I can't go in, into now, but um, it, it, another thing is, as you move to the further right on this spectrum, physical response to the music is, becomes much more important. Whether it's lifting one's hands in the air, or it's moving rhythmically to the music, or actually almost outright dance, a physical response to the music becomes, and that's not an animal. Styles. That, that's a danger of those of us that live in stream two. We think that physical response is an optional thing. It's not an option to those that live in those streams and come from that piety. And so I, I think young people understand this innately almost, uh, intuitively. Uh, but for those of us who grew up in situations where we were told we couldn't dance, we couldn't move, it was wrong, stand frozen, etc. Uh, this, this is an acquired skill. But I wouldn't say, you know, that I, I uh, set a house on fire when I moved, but I'm a white guy from Iowa, and I got over it for the most part. And, uh, <laughs> so I, I think others can too. And I'm surprised, uh, I'm surprised in, in, for example, in recent Global Song, there's, there's two groups that immediately get it in many cases. One I was surprised about, one I wasn't. One were young people. They, I wasn't surprised. I can still remember. Going to, well, as a matter of fact, it was at Hal Hopson's old church, Westminster Press in Nashville, doing it. This is not what you call your usual lower, global uh, venue. I would call it a, a, a lower upper class church. And, uh, and, and, uh, uh, but people, we work with the children and the young people, and they really helped us infect the congregation. And I never forget this, this highly tattooed 13 year old boy you know, uh, spiked hair and stuff. Boy, if church were like this, I'd want to come all the time. You know, kind of thing. And I really thought I didn't change the structure of worship at all. I followed their pattern. I even had a class.
classic hymn there, but it was just the way the music was used and it had more of a, a kinesthetic response. I didn't use any string six. I was using almost totally string seven with a couple of string two because I knew that congregation I didn't want to even cold turkey out of string two. They were Presbyterians. <laughs> um, but the same service, I must have had five or six senior adults come up and say, boy, this was great, you know? I've been so bored sometimes. Uh, don't, uh, this is the one, it's kind of like the old people with green dreams and young people have visions. Uh, I, I use that sort of as, if I'm connecting with those two groups, I'll have the middle people will come along. I'm not too worried about them, but uh, I, I try to figure out why the old folks connect with the global song. And little by little, I think there's a couple of things. Uh, I often use this, it's only in semi in jest that when I would work with congregations, but what we're doing is a choir rehearsal for heaven. And, uh, you know, taking seriously the passages out of Revelation and, and uh, others. Uh, and and that, that, that eschatological reference strikes a chord with some people. But the thing I think really is the issue is a lot of the people that are senior adults grew up, regardless of denomination, strongly involved in foreign missions. And they see this as a fulfillment. The seeds that have been planted are coming back to us. And now we're the receivers, not just the givers. I'm not sure the churches as a whole, in terms of the, of the denominational structures, have made that shift as much as they, should, they could. But there's those kind of factors. There's many other things that you can, you can see by looking at the spread. Now, my, my prescriptive function would say, first of all, what a string or two really defines the, the primary height of your congregation. Uh, and that, that's not for me to judge. None of this is for me to judge. You know what's best for your church. Uh, I don't. I don't have any 10-step plan. But I'd like to suggest then, once you find out what your, see what your primary high resources are, where, in terms of becoming a, a more healthy singing congregation, might you want to expand? Uh, so that over a period of month, you're singing maybe out of four or five strings. And they're having a broader range of theology sung. That would be the, the direction I would want to suggest you might be able to use this in some way. There's a book that will come out on this next year. Uh, and there's different writers for each string. Um, John, Michael Jonkis is doing the first one. Emily Brink of uh, Calvin College is the second one. James Abington. Emory University is the third, David Music is the fourth, uh, Deborah Loftus, who's the new incoming executive director of Hymn Society, is the fifth, a uh, guy named Greg Shear, uh, who uh, lives in Stream 6 but also is able to critique it, I think, well, and then I, and I do Stream 7 with uh, the Asian section done by a former student of mine, Sui Hong Lim. Uh, and uh, so I want to do one more little exercise with them. I'm going to take Stream 2. Turn to creation one. Uh, again, trying to get a, a hint on what our stanza is in the church, what it looks like. And again, this is not, I'm not eliminating classic hymn to give, I'm just trying to get a feel for what our generation has to say about the church. Uh, just because God is unchanging, and God, since a time, dwarfs anything we can imagine doesn't mean that our views from generation to generation don't change about God or aren't affected by our circumstances. Uh, I think uh, any young person that's grown up only knowing, uh, knowing the struggles in Iraq is affected differently than someone else. Anyone uh, who's now aware of a tsunami halfway around the world instantly that's different than the, the 18th century where that information might have come to a place for six months, if, if ever. Uh, on and on it, it goes. Uh, and I think our responses then are, are different to those. Uh, so someone says, well, God's not changing. Well, yeah, fine, I agree with that. But we aren't the same people as our predecessors. We live in a different world, and therefore our response changes. Uh, but I still think it's with respect to what we've inherited. Um, Let's take this one example. You can do the others on your own time. A uh, Cal uh, Calvinistic Isaac Watts approach, a great hymn. Children's hymn written for the first part of the Apostles' Creed, the first article I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth. 
Mike Watts, that we are partners with God in the maintenance and care of creation. In the first hymn, God did it, it's good we enjoy it. We've done that for a few centuries and it's not worked out so well. <laughs> we are partners with God. And he has allusions to Christ's own, own words to help we give our neighbor uh, and these kinds of things. Um, then, the last stanza, by the way, this, is, this hymn is, it should be in the Trinity section of hymns. It could be. The first stanza primarily focuses on the God as creator, and the second on Christ's uh, actions among each other, and the third focuses on the, the, the season of Pentecost, a little double entendre. The season of Pentecost in the Jewish context is the harvest season. So, uh, he's no dummy. So join me. Mother Earth, or from Mother Earth to us. I am 